Hello, everybody, and welcome to a little show we are calling The Thundercast. I am Jason Evangelo. Uh, I do marketing and uh, a lot of the content that you see on the uh, Thunderbird website and newsletters and social media. And I am joined by my awesome colleagues on this and hopefully every episode, Ryan Lee Sipes. Hello. And Alex Castellani. Hello, hello. Let's talk about why we're here. Uh, I know that this is this is a show that we've been wanting to to produce for months, maybe almost a year. And uh, I think one of the first conversations I ever had with Ryan, I don't remember exactly what he said, but he had the name Thundercast like ready to go. And I said, I heard the name Thundercast and I wanted to create a show just based on the name. Yeah, it was too cool of a name and we had to do it. The way that we're kind of framing this is an inside look at the making of Thunderbird, but also community-driven conversations with all of our friends in the open source software space. So in this first episode, we kind of want to like set the stage and, um, and talk a little bit about Thunderbird's history and uh, the milestones that we had in 2022 and what's coming in the future. But then after episode one, we're going to have guests and guests from Matrix and guests from the Document Foundation and and it'll be a little bit less, um, you know, Thunderbird promotion and a little bit more kind of general discussion. So why don't we go around and um, talk a little bit about ourselves, starting with Mr. Ryan Sipes. Yeah. So just in general, uh, probably most people who listen to this will have heard of me, even if they don't realize it. I've been in the open source Linux space for a long time. Um, I have been contributing to projects from my first projects, which were, I was in the Ubuntu community and really early on and, um, and a few others that don't exist anymore, like Mandrake and, uh, Mandriva and, uh, I've just been around never early on was, I was a teenager. So this is like 2004, 2003, 2004, 2005. So wasn't really contributing that much other than just lurking in forums and stuff, answering questions, things like that. Um, it wasn't until um, I was actually out of college and starting on my career that I started actually contributing in any meaningful way. And then uh, most people know me, or at least originally heard about me when I started Mycroft the um, open source Amazon Echo, but it was before Echo was actually out. So the world was still wide open for this type of voice assistant. I went on from there to System76, where I was the community manager and de facto PR person. And then um, crazy enough, uh, kind of on a lark, took a job at Thunderbird as a part-time community manager and uh, ended up uh, working my way up to... um, my title is product and business development manager, which in our little organization means that I make all the product and final say on product and business decisions for Thunderbird, which uh, is a lot. But I'm really glad because when I came on, Thunderbird was super small. We had two people when I came on working on it, and I was part time, and the other person I think was full time. Two people. Yeah. I have to interrupt you. So, what, what year was that? Uh, it was now five plus a little over five years ago. Yeah. We, and we had donations, but at that time it was so much different. We couldn't even get Thunderbird to build every day. That was coming off of a couple of years outside of, um, Mozilla and, uh, and while the community was working really hard, it was just very hard to keep Thunderbird going. Uh, I'm trying, I'm going to try to make this super brief. It's a, it's a podcast though, so we can make this like three and a half hours if we want to. Right? <laughs> yeah. You know? People, it can be like the, the podcast that people fall asleep to, and that's kind of a badge of honor. Yeah. Hopefully they're not falling asleep if it's just the middle of the day right now. And I'm sure we'll talk about this more in a little bit, but long story short, got to take a lot of uh, previous experience and, you know, my startup background and, and, uh, and open source, just all the projects I've been in, apply that to help us raise more money so that we could hire people to work on Thunderbird. And now we're in a very healthy place. We've got 20 some people working on the project and the future looks bright. So 
Um, this is the longest I've been anywhere in my professional life. People who read or listened to uh, the conversation that I had with Alex in the, the first Meet the Team mm-hmm. post, which you can find at uh, the Thunderbird blog, blog.thunderbird.net, they already know the answer to this. But Ryan, I'm really curious, especially since you seem to have such a long history with open source, what initially attracted you to the, the open source movement? And why did you, why did you continue to stick with it? You're going to laugh at my answer and you should. Um, <laughs> I saw barrel comp is, uh, for the Linux desktop. So the, the, barrel com- is that like the cube, the cube and like the, the, the spinning cube? burning down windows and things yes! like that. Comp and the wobbly right, windows. Yeah. And, um, I was definitely a hacker. I was making video games at the time, you know, in high school. Like, that was what I spent my free time doing. And I saw that and something clicked. To me, like, before that, the desktop experience, the experience you had on a desktop computer, which was pretty much the only computing experience you had at the time, was immutable. You couldn't change some things like that. You couldn't make it behave in a different way than what was, than what, you know, Microsoft in, in my case at the time, you know, wanted the desktop experience to be. I mean, there were some things you could do, but you, you didn't really have the freedom to arbitrarily change things and something about seeing that and then getting it loaded on my machine and messing around with values and, and changing how it behaved. It, it hit something (laughs) in a special part of my brain where I was like, oh, this now my computer, I can make it do anything that I want. I was so enraptured by this Linux that I went to the computer lab at school after hours. My mom was a teacher, so I I could run around the school after hours. And I thought, I'm just going to install Linux on all these. Like, you know, like no one, go no one's awesome. going to, no one's going to notice. <laughs> They're not going to notice. Oh no. I made it look like windows. I used like a theme to make it look like, you know, and tried to arrange things so that, cause I just, I, I just had, I was convinced and I was old enough to know better, but I was convinced that this was happening. Like everybody's going to be using Linux. I'm going to, I'm going to use this as like a test case to see if like anybody even notices and then I was in class the next day and immediately, like, everyone noticed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I, sometimes we don't outgrow that, those kind of behaviors. Just last year, I made Linux Mint look exactly like Windows XP. It, yeah. it was impossible to tell the difference until you actually started really digging into, you know, the OS. But uh, I, I still love doing stuff like that. It's so much fun. I never took credit for it. You know, they were like, who did this? Like, Oh, really? They didn't, they didn't catch you? No, no, I I just kept my mouth shut, you know. Is I mean now they know if if anybody <laughs> if any of the school staff listen to this, but they're all retired now, so it it doesn't matter. Well, Alex, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself oh. and what you do with Thunderbird. It's my turn now. How do I follow up that? Uh, well, uh, similar to Ryan, maybe people are sick of hearing my story or who I am, especially if they follow Thunderbird. I've been talking about this for many, many, many times in the blog posts and YouTube and so on. But yes, um, I'm Italian. Uh, I lived, I was born in Italy and I lived in Italy until I was 27. And then one day I got super frustrated with my country and the people around me. So I said, I'm going to move to North America and have a better life. Uh, It was not the... uh, easy dream and the easy win that I was expecting to be, but things turn out pretty well. Um, Challenging, but extremely rewarding. I'm currently the product design manager at Thunderbird. I started as a designer slash developer. If I remember correctly, Ryan reached out to me on my private private slack channel <laughs> like he joined at that time i was doing like open source application i was building things like sequeler and i started creating akira a ux design application written in vala for elementary us and ryan told me hey do you want to work for thunderbird alex the uh, the my my watching you went back quite quite a ways um i had asked um cassidy a number of times about you 
And I was always like, well, what's Alex doing? Because I was following Akira, I was following Sequeler, and I thought, mm-hmm. I thought these are just beautiful applications. And, and so I kept asking, and eventually I was uh-huh. just like, I was just like, well, do you know what he's doing for work? And he's like, uh, I think he's working, you know, at some kind of uh, agency. And I was like, I was like, I'm, I'm just going to hop on a chat with him and just <laughs> tell him he should come work for Thunderbird. So that was, oh, well, thank you for doing that. <laughs> uh, that was a, an awesome, an awesome moment in my life. As you, um, I've been exposed to like open source in general throughout all my life. I started when I was in university because I, I, I talked a little bit in the blog post that was released, but I couldn't afford like, especially all the software to do architecture. They're very expensive, like AutoCAD or Archicad. They were like hundreds of euros at the time. I couldn't afford them. So I found Blender for the first time. I was like, whoa, what is this? And then it's completely free and open source. And then I, I saw some videos online on YouTube uh, about like Blender developers and I couldn't understand what type of operating systems they were using. Uh, And it turned out to be Ubuntu. I was like, what? And as you like, I was running Windows Vista at the time. And then I saw a video comparing the performance of Windows Vista, the fancy aerial graphic interface with Ubuntu. Jaunty Jackalop was at the time, I think. Uh, 1404 maybe with the compits cube and all these things and yeah that blew my mind but yeah thunderbird even before working always on windows that was the name before outlook before gmail before anything else thunderbird was the email client that you had to use because it was the only one that worked properly and allowed you to do things so when you reached out it was a sort of like a dream come true i always wanted to i always dreamed about I wish I could actually work on a cool open source project. Like at the end of the day, of course, everybody wants to make money. Everybody wants to have a job that pays well. But especially in the tech industry, you feel a little bit detached from reality. Every time like you work on a startup that wants to disrupt something specific or you work for clients that don't care about anything other than I just want 20,000 websites per minute and things like that. But finding someone that it's ethical and makes you feel good when you work on it because you know that it helps people, it enables people to do their work. Yeah, it's extremely rewarding. So I've been at Thunderbird for now almost five years. And when I joined, we were five people, I think. And it was funny because I joined and I was like, okay, cool. Uh, we're part of Mozilla. So let us let me see our design system. Oh, no, we don't have a design system. Okay, what type of icons? Oh, no, we don't have icons. Uh, what is the visual direction of Thunderbird? Oh, no, it's fine. It's just, let's code it. Let's maintain it. So it was interesting <laughs> coming from agency work where... You have the creative director and you do like meetings to define prototypes and then you do MVPs and then you go back and it's very well structured coming into these. It was kind of shocking. It's it's taken a while for us to get to a place where we actually have processes for doing this and everything, but it would only work with someone like Alex. And um, I say this for folks who are listening who are maybe running open source projects. Um, it, hopefully there many folks can get into a situation like Thunderbird is where they have a, a reliable donor base or some kind of p- business model that allows them to actually put time beyond just their own time into the app, to their apps. But um, it only works with folks like Alex who get it and who have the passion to take an open source project, apply a certain level of love to it. It almost becomes a reflection of who you are, mm-hmm. right? In, in in some ways. I mean, it's it's very much, you know, there's that phrase garbage in, garbage out. Well, the opposite also applies. And, uh, you know, especially when you're, when you're building communities, if you project a certain type of mindset and attitude and positivity, that is the kind of community that you're going to build and, and see that reflected back at you. So it's, yeah, it's the same way with, with Thunderbird. It really does feel that way. Yeah, I think that having people on the team, and we have a lot of passionate people who bring that passion into Thunderbird and don't just accept, oh, there's Outlook, oh, there's all these alternatives, you know, but but actually like, no, we we are different. What we're making is different. What we're making matters. 
I think that comes a long way. And what, what we're making does matter. It's the free and open source email client and personal information management client. And that's, there's nothing like it. What shocked me first when I came in was the, the invigorating passion of the users using Thunderbird. Coming from startup worlds and agencies, always the next thing, right? Like you build a website for a client, you know, in a couple of years, they will need to redo it because it's outdated now. Or you build a product in a startup because you want to disrupt a specific section of the market so you can bot out and you have your exit strategy and make a quick buck and then the next project again. And your VCs, they change ideas every 20 minutes. It's insane. Instead, you come into Thunderbird and there's a passionate community that have been using the same product and they they love it for all its flaws and all the things that are not properly working. It doesn't matter. It's like a solid user base that is always around. And there is this underlying understanding that this will not go away and it will only get better and improve. And there's the purpose to this product. It's not just a product. Now we kind of sound like a cult, but... <laughs> Yeah, the same thing happened with me because my my past experience was, you know, doing marketing for AMD, which is a huge company. And besides just I was a fan of certain AMD and Radeon products, but it wasn't, you know, I didn't have um I was a small little drop of I was a small little speck of sand uh even inside just the marketing team. And here like it it's 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 really amazing to be able to feel like I can have my own voice. One of the highlights of my day is engaging with everybody on Mastodon. There is something extreme, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, that's not my point to disparage anyone who follows us on Facebook or, or Twitter or uh, anywhere else, but um, there is something special about the collective group of people on Mastodon because they, they just get it, you know? I don't know, they just get it, and they're so supportive and you feel like you feel like you're actually having one-on-one -on -one conversations there with people whereas on Twitter and Facebook you're sort of broadcasting out a message and that's that's kind of it but it feels uh it feels really personal there and really really uplifting so yeah that's my little we got our, our mushy little stories and feel good feelings and we love what we do and we love the people that use our product so well i'll briefly i'll briefly introduce myself uh my name's jason evangelo and in a former life i was a tech journalist at forbes um who discovered linux in 2018 and then pivoted 180 degrees and started covering open source and linux at forbes and uh in a more recent past life i had a podcast and youtube channel called linux for everyone and Alex, I decided I got tired of North America and I moved to Croatia. So <laughs> I'm like the nice. opposite. Switch, <laughs> switch. <laughs> I'm an American in Croatia. Yeah, I moved. Uh, I moved here about five years ago. So, and I've been with Thunderbird, uh, I think, for about t nine months. And uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a dream job. Like, I know we're not. Uh, maybe we're drinking the Kool Aid here, but it's it's a dream job for me because it takes my love of open source. And it takes my experience, you know, creating content and my experience building communities and puts it all together with an awesome team. And it's great. So, yeah, maybe a good segue. Thunderbird's hiring. So if you want to join our team, uh, you can go to the Mozilla Careers page and you'll see Thunderbird stuff listed there. It'll say Thunderbird. If you just type in mozilla.org slash careers, you, it'll it'll end up there. And yeah, we're we're looking for a senior software engineer and a full stack developer at the moment. So if you want to be passionate about what you're working on, please join our team. Uh, Ryan, you mentioned how there were, I think, two or three full-time people at Thunderbird and probably not too many more, Alex, when you joined up, right? Yeah, we were five or six, maybe. And now, how many are we? I think we're 24, mm. 23 or 24. We're going to talk about something else here in a moment, but we're just so grateful to our community and our and our users and specifically of those users, the people who donate to support Thunderbird, that is where all pretty much all of our income comes from, and and uh, that is what we are completely community supported. and And if you want to help support Thunderbird and make it better than any other email and personal information management client out there, like 
go over and, and donate. Keep in mind for, for everyone listening, um, just keep in kind of the back of your, of your thoughts as we, as we continue uh, through the, through the show and we talk about last year and what's coming up, bear in mind that all of these milestones and all of these accomplishments and all of this growth is directly because of our uh, supporters, our, you know, the people who donate, the people who give to Thunderbird, whether that is a one-time donation or whether it's a recurring donation, it literally does make a huge difference. It really, really is amazing. Let's take a, a detour and we're all geeks. It's no secret. I want to talk briefly about what got us excited over the last few weeks that isn't, that doesn't have anything to do with work. Like if it, I don't know, it's a hike or a trip or a song or a movie or a meal that you cooked or, or whatever. Um, there's a, there's a couple things. Uh, although I'm a new father of twins and so I don't have near as much time to actually like do the fun stuff that I discover. So lately, the thing that I've been geeking out over is it, it, twofold. One, I figured out you can really cheaply print boards that that you can then turn into keyboards. You know, like the the PCBs, um, the main boards that that constitute keyboards. And then actually attaching the components and everything is a lot simpler than I would have realized. So you can build your own keyboard for relatively easy and there's enough, there are enough designs out there of boards that you can kind of, if even if you don't have a back, I'm not an electrical engineer, but I can read through these and see them and understand kind of their differences and then kind of make my own decisions and also you know, if you're having a board printed, you can like get a transparent, you know, like encased for it and then have them etch in like art on it. So um, I'm definitely going to make a Thunderbird keyboard and I'm going to have it be one of those split ones, you know, that like yes. butterfly or whatever they call it. Um, Thunderbird logo will be the the super key. the Windows Yeah, key, exactly. Right? The meta key. So that actually is the first project in a while that I saw that I'm like. I'm going to do that. <laughs> That's neat. Keep us posted. Yeah. Keep us posted on that. The other one that I've been working on that I'll eventually share out is I've always wanted to build an arcade cabinet and just have it be uh, an emulator that has like all of the arcade games you could ever want. Legally acquired, you know, Super Nintendo and uh, yeah, all the ones for the lawyers out there, all the games that I already have, you know, load them, load them on there. Um, two projects that I've been building my kind of pocket library with articles on, on how to do the different pieces. Uh, those, that's, what's been capturing my imagination. You know, we gotta, we gotta stop letting this guy go first. <laughs> uh, Cause I can't even come close to topping that. <laughs> we, uh, to feed on your new passion on that. I don't know if you ever heard about the late, uh, night Linux show is a podcast. Um, Joe Resington? Yeah. There's, yep, shout out to Joe. I don't remember who, but one of them already built something like that with um, a Raspberry Pi, put it in a cabinet, and there's an emulator that actually, he talked about this in one previous episode, that simulates the distortion of the actual mm. screen on the sides and is like so realistic. Do you want to know what I was looking at? Uh -huh. I was looking at C CRTs and yes. then a HDMI to to whatever the analog little screw thing. I and they exist. So I'm debating actually having it be a CRT, but oh, an actual CRT? Yeah, oh. yeah. But I'm also a little disgusted That's by glorious. that. So yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to think about that. Just do it. <laughs> and then we're gonna come to your place and just play video games like arcade. Yeah. Yes, we are. Yeah. That sounds so much uh, yeah, that's that's been a dream of mine. Not not something that I ever I really have the resources or patience to accomplish, mm -hmm. but uh, always a dream to have an actual arcade cabinet. Or I would settle for the Miss Pac-Man 
cocktail table. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yep. That's 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 the one arcade yeah. machine that I want to own. That or Super Street Fighter 2. My so mine is not really geeking out, so I don't know if we'll actually title this segment geeking out, but uh I was most excited about a, a my vacation. My wife and I went to the Canary Islands and uh specifically uh Tenerife, which is one of the the largest islands and they were having carnival um up in the north part of the island and you guys for an entire week in february okay it was spring weather it didn't deviate it didn't change it was like 68 to 72 degrees 17 18 celsius something like that 20 celsius some days just absolutely gorgeous uh incredible food incredible scenery incredible uh culture there we 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 one night we um we went out to eat some dinner and on one of the main roads we counted eight live bands on just like two blocks and that that just absolutely delighted me because i'm a huge music freak so the 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 really amazing thing about this area is uh the second to last day we we decided to visit the um volcano now that's that's a very harrowing story because I decided foolishly to rent a moped to go up the mountain oh, no. and did not realize that within 30 minutes it was going to go from that beautiful springtime weather to like zero to absolutely freezing literally freezing <laughs> but that's a that's a separate story I won't go into that but uh it was the the beauty and the and the contrast of of within an hour going from you know wearing having like eggs benedict on the beach in sandals and shorts to driving a moped up to up a mountain road and seeing the volcano that formed the island and and being in this completely different like uh, what's the word biosphere or um ecosystem or something ecosystem right completely different snow everywhere Wow. And uh man, like you just that little island has everything. I actually entertained briefly um moving there because it was so <laughs> just stunning. I mean, every everything there is just absolutely stunning and it's surprisingly affordable for what kind of feels like a, a tourist trap mm. type of place, right? But uh so that's that's what I was excited about. And um I was reading this this new book by Rick Rubin called The Creative Act the whole time and that like all that scenery and that relaxation and, and that book like kind of supercharged my creative juices. And so now I'm making music again and it's just all good. So what about you, Alex? I miss a vacation so much. So I'm <laughs> ah, dreaming about the weather. Like here in Vancouver has been like raining nonstop for six months, uh, which is not giving you mild depression at all, uh, but it's fine. Uh, so Geeking out, uh, I'm a huge music geek. I've been playing guitar my whole life. Um, back in Italy, I used to have multiple bands. Uh, the The week before I moved to Canada, we won a contest and we won. We were booked to play in Paris. And I had to tell my band, I'm sorry, I'm moving to Canada. No. <laughs> yes, uh, my band, they were extremely, extremely upset. So after moving to Canada, I every time I was going back to Italy, once every two years to visit my family, I was bringing back one guitar every time. And now I have five guitars back here. Uh, but I always try to play again, but I couldn't find any people. It was kind of tough. And then last year after COVID, uh, I formed another band and I had my first concert a couple of weeks ago. And it was incredible. I loved it so much. And uh, alongside that, I bought a new guitar because, of course, you cannot have enough guitars ever. And I bought my first Gibson's Les Paul, which it was always been a dream of mine. I was never able to afford it. Uh, I wow. got it and it's the heaviest thing I have ever held. But it, the sound, it comes from angels and demons all together. It's so soothing and powerful and smooth. And Two obvious questions. What's the name of the band? Uh, we don't have a name yet. That's the hardest part of, of having a band, is giving it the name. It is. Like, bands will break up over yeah. just naming the band. But related to that, 
uh, because we wanted to find a band name, after every rehearsal that we end up like finishing at 11 p.m., we hang out to a pub that it's in front of the music room. And this pub is in a basement and there's the Miss Pac-Man cocktail table. Oh, man, I'm, I'm moving. I'm moving to Canada. That's so cool. Well, I, I can't wait till we can, because I, I heard a, a brief snippet uh, that you shared in our Matrix room and it was pretty cool. And I'm looking forward to hearing some music from you. It's funny that actually, I think the three of us all have a musical background. I know Jason is a musician and um, I've told you before, I think that that uh, I was in a band that toured for a little while. What did you play? I was a vocalist, Both. but I, but I, yeah. I, you can't see them because they're not up on the wall yet, but uh, I play guitar, banjo, and a little bit of um, violin. But it sounds like it sounds so, it can definitely go into like creepy violin, nice. you know, <laughs> easily. Like, well, you, like horror movies. Yeah, violin. exactly. <laughs> that, that works for metalcore. That's perfect. Come on. Yeah. Why, so why aren't we making music? Thundercast can turn into a music band. It's fine. I mean, yeah. okay, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about the history of Thunderbird. Being kind of on the front lines of, of all the chatter on social media and, and seeing how the outside world perceives Thunderbird, there is a the, probably the main confusion point is is like are we a Mozilla product or are we not a Mozilla product? And I know that's a very tricky thing to navigate. So Ryan, give us some clarity. To understand Mozilla and Thunderbird, you have to understand a little bit about Mozilla as a company, and I say that with air quotes, people can't see it. So Mozilla Foundation is a nonprofit that if if I say Mozilla and, and and if anyone really says Mozilla, what you're talking about has its roots in the Mozilla Foundation, which is a nonprofit with the charter to just make a better internet for everybody. The foundation owns the Mozilla Corporation, which houses Firefox. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. The main reason is that just U.S. law makes it very hard to create software as a nonprofit and actually hire all the people that you need to, especially if you have a very popular piece of software. And I do think this has changed a little bit over the years, but I know that that in the past, you know, the the IRS has kind of been like, you're hiring developers to make software. That doesn't seem like a charitable activity. Like, you're supposed to use money that you collect for charitable activities. So, so for the, and I think, like I said, I think that is changing, but it hasn't always been that way. And it's been very difficult for, you know, a government tax agency to grok that you could be making software that's for the public good that, you know, is not built around some kind of traditional like business model or whatever. But, but I say all that to say that um, Thunderbird existed for quite some time in the corporation. The problem with Thunderbird was there wasn't really a good funding way to fund its development. So people loved it. It was a popular application, still is, but no one really figured out how to fund it. So Mozilla put it into um, Mozilla Messaging, which was its own little house, and their intention was to find a way to fund, fund its development, and they weren't able to either. Um, it's not trivial to to make an application as robust as Thunderbird. It does a lot, and it's expected to do a lot, and it's expected to do it well. And um, uh, I've, I'm sure there are open source enthusiasts who are listening who are like, you don't need a company, you just need a dedicated volunteers, you know, to make things work. And and that's true to an extent, but but there's always the there's always a problem of something is in a seriously broken state, it's gonna take months to sort it out. You know, like who's going to do that work and who's going to show up every day to make sure that the software is is fixed. And and those pile up over time. Eventually, you have hundreds of projects that no one really has the volunteer time to take on. And uh, so projects 
suffer a lot of bit rot. Eventually, they just die out. So when I came on, it was a couple years after Mozilla had said Thunderbird is still part of Mozilla, but we're turning it over to the community to maintain. And um, the community formed a council, um, elected individuals from the community to kind of guide and steer the project. And um, they hired folks like me with the donations that they did have, which were compared to what we have now were somewhat meager, but they it was enough to hire a few people and to maintain the application. Of course, my role was to uh, be community manager, so to try and orchestrate, you know, how as a community we would continue to support the application. So our success, we were in the Mozilla Foundation, so we were in the nonprofit, and that was great, but Due to a few changes, one of which was just asking our users, finding good ways to ask our users to support us, we ended up getting a bunch of donations and growing. And we grew to be just, as we talked about earlier, too big to fit maybe in the foundation. It was We were already facing all sorts of operational problems um, because of how quickly we were growing and it looked like we would continue growing. And so an entity um, called MZLA was created to house us. And so that's where we sit now. I say all that because even though it's a bunch of business maneuvering and stuff, I I have two really distinct thoughts on that. One is oftentimes open source projects kind of push that into the background and say, like, let's not talk about that, which I think is a mistake because sustainability for open source is a big question. And um, it's one of the things I've always had a big issue with with open source projects is people think a lot lot about how am I going to build the cool thing? but not about how am I going to make sure that this cool thing continues to be built and continues to be maintained. And we see that all the time. We see projects that enormous companies like Amazon and Google rely on, and it'll have like one guy who doesn't get paid to do it, like working on it. And, And this is for folks who aren't in open source world, this is getting into the weeds a bit, but there's a conversation that needs to be had when you're starting an open source project or you're, or if you're, if you're like me, you end up, uh, running an open source project, you have to ask yourself like, okay, like I love this project. It's beautiful. How is it going to be maintained? How is it going to continue to be supported? The the big hurdle is, is that when you're starting an open source project, you're probably not thinking about that. You're thinking about creating the thing, right? If you're, if you're the one creating the thing, you know, there are exceptions, but it, there's a pretty, pretty strong chance that you have the creative skill set to make that project awesome, but you don't maybe not maybe you don't have the skill set to market that project and to you know uh, work with other. It's, there's so many so many layers that go into actually building and then sustaining a project. It's staggering. Yeah, and this is where I give Mozilla credit. Mozilla, among especially the most hardcore open source folks. They want Mozilla to be perfect and to do to always, you know, make the right decisions. But if you're if you're in charge of keeping these big projects that serve tens or in in uh, Firefox's case, hundreds of millions of users, you have a ton of decisions to make constantly, all the way up and down the stack, all the with with every piece of it. How do you from how do you fund it to how do you actually maintain the the software and everything? Even when Thunderbird was at its worst state, the people I consider to be the key stakeholders at Mozilla didn't ever treat it like it was a zombie project, didn't ever treat it like it was a dead project. Now, it was a zombie project in a lot of ways for a little bit, but but they tried to find ways to make sure that we could continue to do what we needed to do in order to make the application available for our users. To kind of bring it full circle, we are Mozilla. We are a part of Mozilla. We don't intend to leave Mozilla. A lot of people say like Thunderbird should strike out on its own. We get a ton of value from Mozilla. The people inside each part of the organization, whether it's the nonprofit, the the Firefox team, and and of course, you know, our, our own team, people across each of these areas contribute to our success. And, and, and we have a lot of people who help us. And so uh, we have gone on a circuitous kind of journey to find 
how we are sustainable, how we can continue to create a great product and a great piece of software. But it took a while, but we couldn't have done it outside of Mozilla. I, I firmly believe that. I think it, it had to be here. So we still are Mozilla. And Mozilla is a big tent with a lot of parts. Yeah. Uh, to add to that, from a purely technical point of view, we rely on a lot of resources in Mozilla, like being able to deploy on their servers and release daily or beta on all the platforms and like all these infrastructure that if we would be completely independent, we would have to pay. And it, the cost is very large. It would affect us. It would affect our ability to hire. It would affect our ability to actually focus on the product. Instead, like we would need yeah, to spend a lot of time, money, and resources into the just the infrastructure that right now we kind of get for free. Alex, do you want to talk a little bit about 102 and what kind of what groundwork we we laid? Maybe it will set the stage for Supernova. For some people, they saw some changes, but maybe not as much as they were expecting last year. And we can talk a little bit about all the invisible work. So, yes, uh, the past year, 2022, but even before that, um, a lot of things under the hood started changing, uh, especially like version 61, 78, they were kind of like always similar. And every time I speak about Thunderbird, because my main area of expertise and my main effort is on the front end, I mostly reference the front end, but also all the things that we've been doing affect also the back end. What happens in the past couple of years with Thunderbird is that we were trying, we were growing, we were adding more developers and more expertise in different areas. So we had the chance and the possibility to actually make some decisions rather than what we've been doing before, which was literally trying to maintain what we currently have as a product and make sure that it releases any builds. Now we have the time, the capacity, and the resources to let's change things, let's decide what new things we can implement on how to fix it and rework it. That wasn't easy, and it's still not easy, because we found a lot of issues and difficulties other than the code base being not ancient per se, but in software development, something that was built 10 years ago right now is ancient because with the progress on web technologies and all the things that change every year, things that you write 10 years ago are nowhere comparable to what you can write today. So the first hurdle was we need to start cleaning up the code. We need to make it more modern from just coding standards and technology standards. And we need to do that so it's easier to update, it's easier to change things. Because right now, every time we get in, it just takes a lot of time to change every little thing. And as soon as you change something, other things in a completely different section, they collapse because they were tangled together 15 years ago and no one remembers or there's no documentation about it. So it's a bit messy. I just, I, I, should, I should point out at this point that I'm not a developer. And so I will always be kind of you know, asking the questions that maybe the audience is thinking about. And it seems like, it seems to me that once the code gets modernized and, and it gets more refined and cleaned up, that the existing team that we have now could actually be so much more productive when it comes to like yes. fixing bugs and addressing uh, maybe, you know, adding accessibility features yes. and adding other things. Is that, is that, yeah. generally correct that's exactly the goal and the purpose of the rework and the rewriting that we're doing one of like a lot of examples that i can make like one of the most glaring examples is just of course like the user interface we weren't able to change anything because in the past we didn't have the designers or the front-end developers to tackle those things so we were just tagging along to what firefox was releasing firefox uses toolbar buttons or uses zool menu pop-ups uses all these toolkit widgets so it's easier for Thunderbird to just repurpose those toolkit, toolkit widgets. But unfortunately, Firefox, they have hundreds of developers and they push hundreds of changes per day and they change those toolkit items to service them, not to service Thunderbird. 
So every time they were making a change, that change was affecting us. And the way that we use those interface and those toolkit UI elements is completely foreign for what they were originally designed for. If you think about Firefox, it's just Firefox is a toolbar and then you have your website and then the interface is just the settings page, which is also another like web page, basically. So there's not much UI and Thunderbird has a lot of UI. So trying to use what Firefox offers to our benefit, every time something changes in the source, then we get affected. And we always had that rushing of once a week, we need to pour things from Firefox. We need to follow along. We need to fix it. And we could never have the time to let's create something new. Let's dedicate our time on these extra project because things were breaking constantly. And this is not, I don't want to throw shade to the Firefox developers. They've been like extremely useful and they always collaborate with us, but is the reality of the fact they are like 200, 300 developers. We were five. It was very difficult for us to tag along and continue. Three years ago, when 78 came out, that was the first step towards, let's try to decouple ourselves from uh, the toolkit of Firefox. Easier said than done, of course. It's been three years now, and we're still doing it. And finally, after three years with the next version, 115, users will be able to see the first actual wins and, and changes that we're doing there and, and we're achieving. Before the development of Supernova, at least let's say the UX and UI mm -hmm. uh, development started, what were both of you most wanting to introduce into Thunderbird 115? Like what was the, the feature that you really wanted to get in there? Vertical layout was from me. <laughs> I mean, I was going to say the same thing. It's actually since the moment I came on and why I reached out to Alex Alessandro, it was my intention to fix the layout. We have many users who love the single line message list, but for me, it's always been a challenge because it just looks like it just looks so dense and and almost cluttered. It just it's just too much at a glance and. Uh, and so for me, it was always every release I thought we would get here. And so to see it actually come to fruition is, is really amazing. It took us three years to reach this point because of the underlying architecture that we were using. Our three, the, the message list and the folder panes, were generated at the time, still today in some parts, but at the time from like a, a C++ interface that spit out, uh, Azul 3 and that was not accessible it wasn't you cannot you couldn't inspect it it didn't accept any variation of the layout other than the table list and the complexity was the fact that that's a, a marvelous piece of engineering because it allows you to print and view millions of emails without affecting your performance because it just fakes the height and recycles when you scroll down, it generates on the fly. So it doesn't matter how long is your inbox, it, it doesn't affect your performance. But that comes from Firefox. And Firefox created that, that piece of engineering for the bookmarks. And the bookmarks list is just a column with a link, and that's it. We took that and we extended it to have the full message with the columns for the attachments and the read and the spam and the favorite and the dates and the locations and the tags and then the message and then you can expand it to have like the thread. So we, we took that initial simple implementation that works perfectly for Firefox. We extended it to the point that is now it's a nightmare to manage because it wasn't intended to be that complex. Every time something changed, it takes years because of the technical complexity, historical, uh, technical debt, and making sure that what we release is on par, if not better, to what it was before. So yeah, all the releases, 61, 78, 102, were the testing ground of slowly changing things and slowly implementing something that is not immediately visible. It happens in the background. And we're sure, okay, it didn't implode. It's not broken, still usable. Okay, let's do something extra, something more. 
And now, yeah, we're approaching 115, which is going to be a, like a big change. Wait, now let's not let's not freak people out when we say big change, uh, because one of the, one of the things that that we recently highlighted is that while there are some modernizations happening with the the user interface, we we very strongly believe in in uh, retaining the type of workflow and the type of visual layout that you're used to, that you've been used to for the last 20 years. And so when we say change, think of it as additional options, not, not as something that you're going to be forced into getting used to and having to change all your muscle memory and, and all that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when I specifically talk about like big changes, I, I was referencing uh, architectural changes that will allow us to maintain what the users love and are used to, but also expose extra features for new users or users that they're tired of the current interface or the current flows and they want something that is different, works differently, it works more on par with modern applications or like competitors. It's making new ways of using Thunderbird available, which we think... And, and and we don't just think. We we use a lot of heuristics and user what we know about user habits and data to try to improve the experience. There are a lot of things that we've done that should make Thunderbird more contextually helpful. In the past, the approach of Thunderbird has been give a giant list of options at any point. <laughs> for someone to interact with a thing. And what we're trying to do is let's give people the most likely stuff that they're going to need at the moment that they need it. And then, you know, if they want, they can interact with it in all these other crazy ways. But let's not give them just like everything all at once. Let's give them like the most likely things they're going to do. And then if they want, they can do the other things as well, which I think will make people's productivity a lot higher. I am a tag user, so I tag my emails to do. I tag my emails important. We're exposing tags so that you can quickly sort email by tags, you know, from the folder pane. And I think that it's all these little things like that that will help unlock people's productivity so they don't have to hunt and peck around for the things that they're trying to do, but actually have those what I consider kind of no-brainers available when they need it. Sometimes we have all this stuff available, but it's it gets lost because there's just so much that you're hit with. If you right-click on a message on Thunderbird 102, most of our users listening to this are on Thunderbird 102, right-click on a message. You can do everything with a message, but all of that stuff gets equal billing there. So what you probably have 42 menu items available to you there. We can do a lot better. We know a lot of how how you guys are using Thunderbird, and we want to make it easier <laughs> to use Thunderbird. Well, it sort of reduces the the it reduces the cognitive burden, right? And uh, and you know this is this is software that a lot of people are in all day long, and uh, we want to make that as pleasant and non stressful as possible for them. You talked about cognitive burden, which I think about quite a lot. Let's let the content of the emails, let's let the activity that the user is trying to do be as painless as possible and, and let them actually engage with like what the thing is. So, oh, you know, like this report. Okay, I want to read the report. I want to respond to it and do that in a way that's in my response is understandable, contextual to my recipient maybe even beautiful, you know, doing that and focusing on that will enable people who are using the application to do more, to be more productive, to be the email hero, you know, in their organization. And And I'm sorry if I'm going way out there, but I feel like that's a job that we as Thunderbird for a long time let slip. We were like, we need to make sure that it does X, Y, Z, you know, all these different things, but we didn't actually spend a lot of time thinking, how do we make the person more productive? How do we make them have more clarity around what they're doing? How do we make them 
yeah, reduce that cognitive load so that they're not looking at their email inbox and just stressed out. And I know we have a lot of users that they love the super compact, all the information all at once. I want to see all together. And that's perfect. We will always maintain that. We will never remove that. But unfortunately, there's been a lot of researches in terms of UX, in terms of what's your focal point, even the simplest thing that your eye, even if you have the illusion that I see 20,000 emails all together so I can see everything, your eye will only have a two millimeters of focal point in the middle. So it doesn't matter if you see 20 messages or two, if you're reading one thing, you can only read one thing. And for many users, having all that information around in their areas that are blurred, it's too much. It's just distracting. You cannot focus on one thing at a time. So why one type of user is right and the other type of user is wrong? Like all users are right or wrong. Like it doesn't matter. There's always a flow that it's perfect for one person and it's horrible for another and vice versa. So we need to be able to support all these things because of all the things that we've been releasing on social media and all the, the great work that you've been doing, Jason, and just sharing all the updates that we do, there's been a lot of talk about all the changes that we're doing at Thunderbird in other media, in other podcasts. And there's a recurring thing that I hear from users that have been using emails for many, many years, and it's email is not broken, don't try to fix it. Why are you changing things? And if anyone has any experience in software development, first of all, we're not trying to change email. The email protocol, the email concept is not what we're trying to change. We're talking about our application, talking about Thunderbird. And an application is never finished. If you don't constantly maintain it, if you don't constantly update it and refactor it, it will get stale. As Ryan said, it will be rot and it will turn into a zombie, it will turn into abandonware. Because things change in the background, architecture change, and then the release uh, toolkits change, and uh, the ability to run that application on an updated operating system. We, sh we cannot ask the user, hey, stay on Windows 7, because otherwise Windows 11 is not supported, because we haven't updated, we haven't changed anything, because Thunderbird is not broken, so we shouldn't change it. Updating the architecture of Thunderbird to make sure that is sustainable, maintainable, and can be upgraded and coded for the next 20 years, it's also like one of the most important things. The fact that by doing so, we gain the ability to do all the extra cool things on top, it's mostly gravy and it's what the user will experience. But in the background, what we're trying to do is trying to make Thunderbird sustainable and fast and light for the next 20 years. The, the last thing I'll say on the on the front end stuff is this work is amazing. And if you go and you pull down daily, bear in mind it's alpha. So some things do act funky, but if you if you load up the vertical layout, which has the multi-line message list, which if people don't know what I'm talking about, it means that instead of just a single line that in your message list that has all the information, we actually now can display over two or more lines some of the email content, the author, the subject, you know, is it starred? Is it t tags aren't supported at the moment, but is it tagged? You can immediately see and feel the difference of the application. And to go back to your original question, Jason, and I know we spent a long time on this. I think that this is the largest change since Thunderbird was made. And I think it will also have the greatest positive impact on our users' productivity and experience of using Thunderbird than anything that we've done or will do for the next few years. What do you guys recommend if people really want to check out some of the changes that are already implemented, kind of a supernova preview? Do you recommend that they check out daily or should they stick to beta? Probably beta. Right now, beta will, I think, is is in a state where we've never, we've always had beta be very sacred and not very experimental. Right now it's in an, for the first time ever since I've been around in an experimental state. But I think here in the next couple of weeks, if folks pull down the beta and they start using it in the next couple of weeks, they'll see beta, not couple, next couple of weeks, the next beta release, which will be, I don't know when the next beta two release weeks, is. Yes. Two weeks. So next couple of weeks. Um, yeah. 
I think it will start to really take form even more. And by the time we get into April, um, May, it should be much, it should be much closer to, um, in a state that I think everybody would expect that they could look at that and probably say, this is really close to what we'll get. Because for for people who who aren't following uh, the roadmap or kind of the you know the the inside baseball type stuff, the feature freeze has already happened. So the the takeaway there from from me as a you know as a non developer as a user is that Thunderbird team is spending a lot of time on polish and on stability and on performance and not you know oh we got to get this feature in at the last minute and it might be broken but that's that's on the roadmap and we have to do it so. That's I really respect that because not only is it going to be such a uh, a really like a breath of fresh air visually, but it's nice to see the team allowing several months just to just to add the polish. The, yeah, we broke the cycle a little bit because, as Ryan said, beta has always been extremely stable. Yeah, almost as stable as one or two, but with the ability to get once a month and four updates every beta with like new releases or new features a little bit earlier. This time we decided let's actually use beta to get some meaningful feedback because our beta population is very small compared to our ESR population. So when we release a final stable release, then we get a bunch of bug reports that we never consider, we'd never seen because our beta population wasn't that um, extensive, the testing wasn't that extensive on beta. So this time we ramped up our social media presence. We started talking about Supernova. We started exposing when things will happen. And then we decided let's release all these things that we built in the past four months, five months, seeing from September to January on February beta. We know that it's not super stable. We know that it's unpolished and unfinished. But since we're on, free, on feature freeze, we're not building any extra news. Like all the things that are in the code base right now are the things that we're shipping in 115. So we're going to take the next five months to just polish them. And in order to highlight or find out all the issues, we need to expose these to our beta users. And we apologize if some beta users get upset because we they, they relied on beta for many years thinking that it was extremely stable, but it needed to be done in order to have as much feedback as possible and expose these new things to the users as early as possible. And we're going to have, um, I'm sure at the, uh, wherever this is published, it'll be published on the Thunderbird blog and, and other places, but in our show notes, we'll have a place where you can... Uh, leave feedback if you're a beta user. Maybe you haven't joined uh, the mailing list. I'll, I'll, you know, we'll show you where that is, and uh, we'll of course have links to links to Thunderbird on the Fediverse and on YouTube and on PeerTube and all the other social um, network places that you can talk to us and, and leave us feedback. And a couple of things, lovely things happen. For how many users got upset and they were some like vocal discontent, like very, very strong discontent on on the things that we did, we got an equal, if not higher number of users that actually joined the beta willingly and started participating in bug reports and bug triaging. And the, the participation of our community, a lot of users just joined, signed up into Bugzilla and started learning how to use Bugzilla and bug triage things for us. It's incredible. It's heartwarming. I I just want to say, like, if you're listening to this show and you are someone who is active on Bugzilla, you're filing bug reports, props to you and thank you, because let's not uh, beat around the bush. It's difficult. Using Bugzilla, actually not just Bugzilla, but the majority of bug reporting platforms that are out there are not easy to use. You know, it can be time consuming. There's a lot of detail that goes into it. And, and I wish it was easier, but just know that you're making a, a huge difference. Yeah. The learning curve is pretty steep. So we would have never expected something like that. We were expecting we're going to release this beta. Our community is going to be very upset because things are not finished and polished and stable, but at least we are going to get some bug reports on things that are broken. And instead, it was completely opposite, like a lot of excited people. Yes, we got some complaints, but a lot of excited people, very detailed bug reports, 
people that are every day in our matrix room and on Bugzilla helping us to identify things. It's incredible. It's really like mind blowing. Now, something that, that definitely deserves mention here, and, and probably, and in fact, I think we will be giving it its own episode, is Canine Mail. You know, we, it, it's, it's a much lower profile right now than, than Thunderbird, but for people who uh, are not keeping pace, you know, because it's, it's a fairly recent development, uh, Canine Mail is an open source email application for Android. And uh, it recently joined the Thunderbird family, and we hired the developer full time. And uh, in fact, we recently hired another developer full time to work on Canine Mail. And long story short, um, Canine Mail will eventually transform into Thunderbird for Android. So let's talk a little bit about that before we close out the show. Yeah, for a long time, especially my pet project was getting Thunderbird onto mobile. Um, it was definitely something that for ever since the day I came on, in fact, when I interviewed, I said, one of my goals will be getting Thunderbird onto mobile. And it took me years, but I finally got it. If, if I'm being honest about my own email habits, I, I definitely read a lot more email on mobile. It might be equal to how much I reply to stuff on mobile or desktop. It's really important when we have these supercomputers in our pockets, that Thunderbird's values, our, our thoughts on how an email experience should be, I thought it was important that we be where our users are at. And um, mm. that's increasingly more and more in the mobile context. Yeah. And so uh, I, I spoke with Keddy, who is the maintainer of K9. He has been for a long, long time. <laughs> K9 itself is a fork of the uh, original Android email application that came out with Android, you know, when Android came out. Now, you I don't even think you get an open source email client out of the box. I'm pretty sure on most phones you don't. You get yeah, Samsung's Gmail. email or, yeah. or Gmail. Mm -hmm. So uh, talking with Keddy, we are, the values of the two projects were aligned. K9 has been chronically underfunded. <laughs> Um, that's not that's not a knock on the community. They they have been funding the application, but it's just I don't know. It's a, a matter of scale of of just Keddy being the only person trying to both develop the application and raise money for it. And so the project and um, its key contributors agreed that it should be a part of the Thunderbird family, and so it joined the Thunderbird family. And this year, either slightly before or slightly after. 115 Thunderbird for Android, which will be K9, as but with all the features we've identified that have to be there in order for it to be Thunderbird, to be called Thunderbird, will be ready to go. And what are those features? That's the burning question, right? Because I know, I know when people hear this, they're going to think or they're going to maybe hope that a lot of the like power user type of features uh, move from desktop to to mobile and and that's that's really where you know k9 fortunately had quite a few power user features and settings that i think that most of our users appreciate and i think that a lot of our users who went out to find the thunderbird experience on mobile found k9 so so the main things we focused on is a few different things one is making sure that no matter what account you bring to k9 to Thunderbird on Android, it'll work and it'll be set up and you won't have to hand jam a lot of settings or whatever. Nice. Um, and so OAuth support for major providers, that, that that was a big thing that we did. Right now, the new account setup is going into K9, so that's going to allow uh, K9 to use Thunderbird's uh, auto discovery stack, which will allow... If you type in a Yahoo account, it'll know it's a Yahoo account. It'll do all the right settings. This is something that K9 didn't have. So uh, usually it would make the right guess. But if you had a custom domain or something, it, it wouldn't always. That has been a problem for new users of K9. That's, that's going to be resolved, I imagine, this month. 
or early next month. There's a lot of UX UI improvements that have gone into it. Uh, you can actually see pretty much all of those, I think, that are going to get in, maybe minus a few little nits right now. In the beta, right? In uh, version 6.5500. Yeah. 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 And uh, by the time you hear this, yeah, that that probably won't be beta anymore. I agree. But uh, version 6.5 is what you want to look for. And if you, if you just want to see some visuals, we have uh, several screenshots on the Thunderbird blog. And and what those, for, for folks who don't end up checking that out, um, that looks like uh, we have a new message view. So when you're viewing a message, all the header information and everything is now arranged in a better way. If you, at a glance, you can get, I feel like a lot better sense of this, the message, like who is the message from, what is what is happening here. But if you want to dig into the nitty gritty of the message, or if it's just a message with a ton of recipients in the past, that would just take up half your screen. And now you can click on the message header and you can see all these different, all this recipients, other additional information about the message, which is really nice because then that's actionable. So if you see someone on the list, you can just click on them and send a, a message directly to them. Um, you can save them to your contacts, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's a really great improvement. The message list now has more options. It's, it's better laid out. Much like with Thunderbird on desktop, it's, it's a little less just dense by default, but that allows you to kind of a better understand your inbox at a glance. But, but like with Thunderbird, you can make it compact, you can make it uh, more relaxed, or you can just go with the default out of the box. And and the canine is really granular. You can change it a ton. Um, so if you want, if you want something that is just hyper dense, it's very easy to set that up. But you know, for those of you who might have issues with um, text size and things like that, there's options for making it even larger and the content larger so that. I know I have some users in my family who it, they need it big, they need it relaxed so that they can so they can see what they're actually interacting with. Will there be any kind of communication between your Thunderbird desktop client and Thunderbird for Android in terms of like account settings or any other features that both applications have? Will they be able to talk to each other? Well, so here's the deal. Some of these things like tags and filters, are they don't exist in KN right now, like that concept doesn't exist. That is landing this year. So folks will be able to set up filters, set tags. Tags is a, it's an IMAP feature. So it's, it's not a, a something special, you know, if you tag stuff, you know, on one machine that, that will automatically show up as long as the client supports it. So K9 will support tags. Syncing is something that we are going to get done. Uh, it will be done. I can, I'm pretty confident it will be done this year. Um, I'm not sure it will be ready at the release of Thunderbird on Android. I'm not sure it'll be ready with mm -hmm. the 115 release, but I think that before the end of the year, I would expect users to be able to sync their accounts between desktop and mobile. That's something that we really hoped to have in time for the release. Um, but I can't make that promise at the moment. Other improvements is folders on K9. Right now, it's you're not working with the same space you have on desktop. So a big folder list can be a lot. <laughs> so we've played around with some with some ideas. I know Ketty has has done a lot of thinking on on how can we make folder management work in K9 and and we're getting there. And so so better folder management and better ability to view and manage your folders will be coming to K9. And, and that's something that even Gmail, for instance, doesn't do that well. And so I'm excited to be able to bring a better experience there. But that that's, I think, most of what we're working on. And then going into the future, we've already started exploring. You know, you're on mobile, you go for the weekend to you, the cabin. And uh, one thing we're discussing is profiles. So I have my work 
email, maybe my small business that I also like run on the side, my side hustle and my personal email in there, we're going to be trying to, we're going to try to sneak in things like profiles so that you can say on the weekend, no work, no side hustle, things like that. So, and I think that would be a good feature for Thunderbird desktop too, but there are some mobile specific features that we think will be good quality of life. That's stuff to look forward to after the release, but still things we want to tackle sometime this year. There's a lot going on, and that's not even everything. (laughs) That's just what we've talked about in this episode. There's a lot more going on. Oh, man. Yeah, it's going to be a good year. We do get questions just to top off the mobile discussion about iOS. We are hiring an iOS developer um, to begin to lay the groundwork for Thunderbird on iOS. It's not as easy as with K9. There's, There's not any pre-existing clients that are still maintained and still have authors who are active in those. I, I've looked and I have found some open source iOS email applications, but they're they're in worse they're in really bad state as far as I've found. So we're we're gonna have to lay the groundwork and I'm not sure if anything will be available this year. But I'm hoping at some point next year we have we'll be able to share something, even if it's a very early build. Yeah. So if you're an iOS developer and you love open source and you love email, just keep your eyes peeled. Well, guys, we have covered a lot of ground <laughs> tonight. Thank you so much for joining me and for, I don't know. Talking about Thunderbird and open source and all the awesome Thank, things thanks, that, Alex. that will come in the future. Yeah. My, my, uh, my show host legs are a little, a little rusty and, it's fine. We are also, we are developers. We're not showmen. So if this is a bit rusty, it's okay. We'll get better with time, but yeah. Yes, yes, indeed. If you want to get the Thundercast, it should be, by the time you're listening to this, it should be available in your favorite podcast app. You know, all the major ones, all the small ones. Uh, it will always be on blog.thunderbird.net. And... um We'll be sharing it, of course, across all of our social media accounts. And you you can't miss it if you follow us anywhere. We'll make sure that you know there's a new episode. Our plan right now is to do uh, one episode per month just so that we, you know, you want to take a a few days to listen to it in chunks. You can do that. And that ensures that we have the time to also sit together and record a quality episode um, and get, you know, a a great guest as well. Because the next uh, the next episodes after this, we'll have some some friends in the open source community to talk to. And if you have any direct feedback for the show, you can email us. That makes sense at uh, podcast at thunderbird.net. Any, any, uh, any last word, last words, (laughs) any parting, parting words or a little highlights of the future. You know, we've talked about bringing on friends in the open source space. So if you're, so, so tune in again, to talk, we'll talk to folks from other projects that we think are interesting, but also we're going to bring in some folks who work on different parts of Thunderbird. And so at some point, we'll probably talk to Ketty over at K9. And nice. I'm excited yeah. to talk to some of the other core developers in the project who have their own unique insights about all the, the work that goes into creating such a robust application as Thunderbird. We really appreciate everyone who who uses Thunderbird, who shares that they use it, who contributes in any way, whether that's, you know, getting it set up for a friend or or an in-law, contributing uh, translations, which is a a big deal. There's, you know, Thunderbird's available in dozens of different languages, doing testing. There's so many ways that, uh, that our Thunderbird community makes a huge positive impact. And we thank, just thank everybody immensely for for doing that and um yeah anyway thanks for being on the thunderbird journey with us and um we'll see you around for we'll see you for episode two in about a month